degrees of freedom as there are directions of, of uh, high compliance. And so, um, so anyway, th there, there's, um, there, there's many definitions of degrees of freedom. They're, they're not all unified, um, but for constraint-based design, the definition of a degree of freedom is if you, have, if you assume the system is an ideal model where these are infinitely stiff along their axis, infinitely compliant in all the other directions, degrees of freedom are the directions with no stiffness, and degrees of constraint are the directions with infinite stiffness. Okay, that's, that's the definition we're going off of here. And again, no motion is implied. They're, they're just, for the very first infinitesimal motion, you know, you know, some finite number divided by infinity range you're moving, um, you know, which is essentially zero, will tell you uh, what the degree of freedom is, okay? All right, so anyway, if that's confusing, you'll, you'll, you'll get the idea later on here, okay? So, uh, next principle is for a two-dimensional um, scenario, okay? The, James Clerk Maxwell uh, came up with an equation that relates uh, the number of non-redundant constraint lines, you know, those blue constraints, um, to the number of degrees of freedom, the, the, uh, the unconstrained directions of uh, permissible motions, right? Um, and, uh, and it's a very simple equation. So by the way, James Clerk Maxwell's, you know, he's the guy that did everything in science that, you know, Newton and Einstein didn't do and stuff. <laughs> you know, he seemed to do everything. He did the equations of electricity and magnetism, you know, combined them all and completed them. And, and uh, it, one of the many areas he pioneered was constraint-based design, okay? So, so he noticed that um, for a two-dimensional scenario where things have three degrees of freedom, um, this is where the three comes from, every time you add a constraint, C, you'll take away one degree of freedom, okay? That's why he said three minus C equals R, okay? So, let me show you what I mean by that. So say this scenario, this is grounded, that's a body that right now has three degrees of freedom. So it has zero constraints, three minus zero is three, that's three degrees of freedom. Okay, now let's say we add this one constraint. So now it's three minus one, because we added one constraint. That means there should be two degrees of freedom remaining, and there are. This translation died, and we just left with this rotation and that translation. Okay, that degree of freedom. Okay, well let's, okay, and there's the blue line of the ideal constraint. Okay, now let's go back and say, okay, well, let's add the constraint here. It almost doesn't matter where you add it, add it according to this, right? You add it over there, 3 minus 1 equals 2. There's still 2. They're different. You, this time you killed the translation here, and you're left with the rotation and the translation there. Okay, okay, well, now let's add 2. Let's add this and this. So 3 minus 2, um, well, you expect 1 from this equation. Is that true? Yes, you just have a single rotation. You've killed the translation and the translation there, and you're just left with the rotation. Now, this rotation will always occur at the instant center of these uh, wires. The instant center of wires is where they intersect. So if you draw the blue line, where they intersect is where that will rotate, okay? Um, and you'll see that's the degree of freedom. If you cat it and find the, the uh, first, you know, the mode shape, uh, it, it will give you this. And by the way, that, that's another definition of degree of freedom that doesn't quite jive, you know, sometimes it corresponds, you know, it corresponds loosely uh, with constraint-based designs, uh, you know, definition of it, um, which is, uh, you know, modal analysis says degrees of freedom are the first uh, natural frequencies, or the mode shapes associated with the first natural frequencies of the system. So if you CAD this, and do a frequency analysis and find an element analysis, it'll give you, you know, the first, you know, however many mode shapes you ask for. There's, of course, an infinite number. Um, but, uh, you know, usually, like SOLIDWORKS will, I think, default just give you six, the first six. And it'll give you natural frequencies corresponding to those six. And, uh, you know, the lowest natural frequency corresponds to the first, uh, you know, um, mode shape, which is the... Uh, um, Right, the degree of the degree of freedom, because as it's the lowest compliance, uh, or sorry, the, the highest compliance, um, and th this one, uh, its its first mode shape is this, and so that's that's the most compliant direction, okay. But you'll see, um, we will talk about this a little later. You you could tune the mass of the stage uh, in different ways and change those natural frequencies, and there's no clear cutoff of like, you know, when 
when is the natural frequency low enough to be considered, to have a mode shape linked to it to be considered a degree of freedom? Because uh, if you have a, just a giant mass, you know, everything, no matter how stiff it is, has natural frequencies and mode shapes. But at some point, the first natural frequency is so high, it's not, it, it's a constrained direction. So anyway, th there's n it's not very systematic and clear if you go with the mode shape thing. But um, mode shape definition. Um, you know, and, and who's to say the first three or the first four or the number of degrees of freedom? It's, it's, it's kind of a hand wavy um, definition, but it can be useful to uh, confirm constraint based designs definition. And indeed, here it does. The first mode shape corresponds with the degree of freedom, okay? The first degree of freedom. Okay, or the, un, the un, unconstrained or permissible motion. Okay. Okay, so. Now we have, uh, now we're going to take things to the third dimension, okay? Uh, you know, we know that, you know, for two dimensions you have three degrees of freedom, two translations and a rotation out of plane. Um, but now for three degrees of freedom, if you have just a floating body in a three-dimensional existence like the one we live in, um, you have six degrees of freedom, okay? You have three tra orthogonal translations and three orthogonal rotations, okay? Um, or better said, three independent rotations and three independent translations, okay? So you can, you can move in those directions and with any combination of those three you can get any motion. So things in three dimensions that have no constraints can move any way you want, okay? With any combination of those six, right? That, that goes back to the proof of um, our transformation matrix and why we added six, uh, you know, three rotations, three translations to get the twist we wanted, if you recall from uh, lecture two. Okay, so but again in three dimensions the simplest uh, constraint is a wire flexure, okay, um, and except now you can see that it's three-dimensional, uh, you'd attach your body on here and now because it's three-dimensional it, it, it has five degrees of freedom and it really it still just constrains the translation along its axis, okay, and again you model it as if it's infinitely stiff along this, this axis it can't be buckled, it can't be stretched, it can't move at all, it's just infinitely constrained and then it's infinitely compliant with no stiffness, no resistance in the two perpendicular translations and the three rotations. It can do torsion and everything, okay? So a good model for this, by the way, is a string. You know, a string behaves like this except, of course, it, it, it buckles immediately. So, um, you know, but a, a wire flexure, just like a, a, you know, like say a hanger in your closet, just a wire like that, if you cut it off on both ends, just get a wire, it, it behaves nicely like this. Um, but of course there's finite stiffnesses in, in all the directions. But you'll see orders of magnitude difference in the, the degree of freedom directions, okay? Um, okay, so, so that's, what, that's what a single wire does in three dimensions. So, and so James Clerk Maxwell, uh, you know, he has an equation for three dimensions which is very similar, except instead of 3 minus C equals R, he said 6 minus C equals R, because in three dimensions, uh, there are six degrees of freedom. And for every constraint you add, you take away a degree of freedom. So let's look at uh, this example. Say this is a grounded, and say that's a body, OK? And it's got, it's got these two wire flexures um, joining it from the ground. Now, again, you might recall from uh, the first lecture, we, we defined there's different types of flexure systems, OK? Um, Remember, there's parallel, serial, and hybrid, where the definition of parallel is two bodies connected directly together by uh, these flexible elements, okay? So this is a parallel system. It's got a single ground, which is here, and a single stage, and it's connected directly together by that, okay? That's a parallel flexure system, okay? But that's a little tangent, so let, let's go to this equation here. Um, you ask yourself, how many constraints are in this system? Well, there's two, right? So it's six minus one, two. There's your two blue uh, ideal, you know, constraint lines. So six minus two constraints equals four. Okay. So so that means there should be four degrees of freedom. If these guys were infinitely stiff along their axis, they couldn't compress or stretch. Um, but then they were infinitely compliant in all other directions. How could this guy move? Well, you could put me on pause and visualize it. Um, but sure enough, um, uh, they would move like this. Here, here's the answer, okay? You could imagine they could translate in this direction, they could translate in that direction without stretching and compressing these. 
They could rotate around here and rotate around here. What they couldn't do is rotate around this one, okay, because that would cause these guys to move in and out, and they can't do that. And they also can't translate in this one, whether they go this way or this way, it would cause them both to either compress or stretch in the same direction. So those are the two that are killed by those two constraints, and, and those are the four that exist. Now, now, remember, if you can't visualize that, sometimes it's helpful to cat it and do a frequency analysis and look at the first four mode shapes uh, associated with the four lowest natural frequencies. And you would find the mo you know, they, they do correspond with the degrees of freedom as predicted by you know, constraint-based design. Okay, so here's, here's the first four mode shapes, and you can see that they, they move nicely in these directions, okay? But again, remember, once this guy, you can see this guy's kind of arcing up, that's a, that's a finite motion, and that would indeed happen, but the degree of freedom is really, before this ever moves, even a finite amount, uh, what's the direction of compliance? It's purely straight up. It's a pure translation straight up. Okay, so don't think of motions. I show them to help you visualize, but uh, degrees of freedom are directions of compliance before anything actually deforms. Okay. Okay, so that's the application of this, and so it's a, it's a really cool equation. So let's let's do some examples to convince you of its truth. Okay. Um, say we have we're going to take this example where it's grounded here. That's the stage. Here's the things, and it, here's the four degrees of freedom that it has right now. So six minus two equals four. We're going to add a constraint, okay? Um, so say we add this constraint right there, and this, this guy's grounded there as well at the top. So this is still a parallel system, by the way. We have a single, we have two rigid bodies, one ground, this and this are both ground, so they count as one body, and one stage. So you've got the stage connected directly to ground by flexible elements. So again, this is a parallel system. Even though it looks deceiving, it looks like there's three rigid bodies, one up there, one here, one here. Uh, it's not. These two bodies are both grounded, so they're basically the same ground because they have the same relative velocity, which is zero. They're, they're fixed. And so any, anytime you have mechanism theory, if you have multiple grounds, you count them as a single link. They're one body connected together. So this is a parallel system. Okay, but anyway, so we add this third constraint. that We expect six minus three now, one, two, three. We expect three degrees of freedom. So the question is, of these four that existed before, which one dies? Which one does this kill? Well, obviously it kills the translation two. And so here you can see, here's the three remaining natural frequencies. And again, those were the first three mode shapes. Okay, and you can visualize, uh, they could move like that with no resistance if these were ideal constraints, um, but all the other directions would be infinitely constrained with the ideal constraint assumption, okay? Okay, now let's say we add another constraint. So again, 6 minus 3 is 3. Which one does it kill now? Well, you stare at it, put me on pause, uh, or, or I'm just going to give you the solution here. Um, if you put this one now, you can't rotate around 3 without stretching or compressing these guys. Okay, so it kills that one. Here's the first three mode shapes. Okay, and look at that, visualize, recognize, teach yourself, and let your brain Realize that those things wouldn't have to stretch or compress along their axis, but they'd be infinitely you know, compliant um, in the directions you see here. Infinitely stiff in all the other directions. Okay, so here, um, what about this one? Now say we add this third constraint. Um, which one does it kill? Well, obviously it kills four. Okay, here's the three degrees of freedom that remain. Okay, so in the previous three examples, we successfully added a third constraint to this system to eliminate degree of freedom two, three, and four. So now what I want you to do is a challenge exercise problem. Can you add a third constraint, a third wire where it's grounded on the backside, um, you know, so it's still a parallel system. Can you add a third wire to the system to eliminate degree of freedom one? Is there a way to add a wire that does that? So definitely put me on pause and think hard about it. Okay. Okay. I'm going to assume you did that. Um, I'm going to tell you. Uh, you know, most students usually look at this and say, "Okay, well, let's add a wire like up here that's like along this line, but out here, like that, because that would kill this rotation. You couldn't rotate around there because it would cause this to stretch or compress. So, job done." 
But then they start looking at, well, but if I do that, it also kills this translation, because now we have a wire in that direction, kills that translation. And so it's like you know, students start thinking, well, did I kill two degrees of freedom with a single constraint? Um, no, you didn't. Okay, the, the, the hard rule is, and remember Maxwell's equation, one constraint can only kill one degree of freedom. So you'll never have a wire that kills more than one degree of freedom. What actually happens, so that's a principle, make sure you learn that. One wire can only kill at most one degree of freedom. Okay, you're never going to kill two. What happens though if you put a wire there is you kill this one, the translation, and this rotation now moves up to there. Okay, it's still parallel to these two guys, but it now intersects um, the wire's axis here. So it could rotate up there. So you just moved a degree of freedom. And that's another principle. There's nothing forcing degrees of freedom to be stuck in the center of a square stage with, you know, stuck to three orthogonal axes. Okay, that, that's just engineers like to use, you know, our brains are tuned to work well with 90 degree angles and things that are orthogonal. And, and so since translations and rotations are the most different kinds of motions, we align them all on three orthogonal things and like to stick them in the center of a stage and think about degrees of freedom that way. But nature doesn't care about orthogonal lines or, or any of these things. The truth is that degrees of freedom can move all around and they're not stuck to a coordinate system, okay? Like we're doing here. I, I'm teaching you this way because, you know, it's an easy way for your brain to kind of visualize and get into things. But I'll show you later there's nothing that forces them to be about on these, this coordinate system, okay? So th then you might say, well, what's the answer to your question here? If, if a wire here doesn't work, it kills this four and moves that rotation, um, you know, so it didn't actually kill one, it moved one. Um, how can you kill one? How can you stick a wire in there to keep two, three, and four, but just not have one anywhere? Well, the answer is you can't do it with a parallel system. There's no wire that can be stuck in this um, that can maintain two, three, four, and kill one. Um, but but you, the only way you can achieve this combination of motions, two, three, four, without one, is by using a serial or a hybrid system. And I'll, I'll prove that in later lectures. Um, but right now we're kind of just focusing on parallel systems that consist of a single rigid stage connected directly to ground, um, you know, by these elements, okay? Okay, so it's a trick question. I'd like I did teach you some principles. Okay. Okay, so exact constraint. These three topics are some of the most important things you can learn in engineering. Exact constraint, over constraint, and under constraint. And they're not taught in many engineering courses, which really blows me away. Um, Almost 90% of the time, if you do consulting to try and fix a machine, say there's some machine and it's not working uh, for mechanical reasons, not, I mean, if, okay, if a circuit blows, then you need to be an electrical engineer or something, but, um, right, but, but if, if you have a mechanical machine and the mechanical motions and behaviors and forces, something about it uh, mechanically isn't functioning, usually it's because the machine is violating one of these principles and the designer of it or the people using it uh, don't understand these principles to fix it. And if you understand these principles, exact constraint, over constraint, and under constraint, then you can just do work magic. Even if it's not intuitive, you can just fix their machine and it works beautifully. And, and you can make lots of money consulting. So uh, these are very important principles to understand. They're the core of this course, okay? Um, and, and uh, okay, so, so, so first of all, I, I want you to understand, um, uh, th you know, that, th that there's basically two concepts here and they both have opposites, okay? So there's, um, you know, something is either exactly constrained or over, or over constrained. So these two are opposites, okay? Under constraint has nothing to do with exact and over constraint, really. It's a separate issue, okay? A lot of people think, over and under constraint are opposites just because the words make it sound like, you know, over is opposite of under. But they're totally unrelated. You can be both under constrained and over constrained. Okay? But you can't be over constrained and exactly constrained. These two are opposites. Exact constraint and over constraint. You're either one or you're the other. Okay? They're opposites. Okay? This is a totally different category. You can be exactly constrained and under constrained, and you can be over constrained and under constrained, right? So what's the opposite of under constraint? Well, not under constrained. 
okay, is the opposite of that. So the opposite of exact constraint is over constraint. The opposite of under constraint is not under constraint, okay? Um, okay, so, but what are they, okay? So let's, let's uh, talk about exact constraint first. All right, so let's go back to this two-dimensional example where we know if we add a third constraint, um, or sorry, if, if you add, you know, this 2D example where you have three degrees of freedom, so you start with three minus, for every constraint you add, you kill a degree of freedom. So, so let's do this, okay? So when we add this constraint, we, you know, we, this is one, and this should be two. It kills this translation there. You see how that goes away, and you're left with this, okay? So you'd agree with me that this wire is doing a single unique job of killing that translation, okay? Any time a constraint is doing a single unique job of killing a single degree of freedom, it is said to be exactly constrained, okay? So really any scenario that follows Maxwell's equation here is exact constraint. And I know you're like, well, but they all, the Maxwell's equation is always true, right? But yes, it, it always is. So it's, it's a little confusing to teach this principle until I tell you the opposite, which is over constraint. But just, just go with me here for a minute, okay? So let's, let's now add another constraint here. 3 minus 2 is 1. Okay, because this equation is true, this, you know, is an exactly constrained system. And guess what? This guy is doing the job of killing this translation. This guy is doing the job of killing that translation. And they're totally independent jobs. They're each doing the job of killing one of these two uh, degrees of freedom. So there's three in here, and the, there's two in here, and they're each killing two, so they leave one. Okay? They're doing the single unique job of doing that. So that system is exactly constrained. Okay? So now we add this, okay, right here, and that adds a third constraint that kills it, and now you can't rotate this, because if you try to rotate this, this guy would stretch or compress. Okay, so it killed that guy. Okay, now, now you might say, but wait a minute here. It was clear to see how this, this did the unique job of killing this translation, this did the unique job of killing that translation, but both of these are doing the same job of killing the translation. You'd think, well, they're both in the same direction. They're both killing the translation, so they're not doing a unique job anymore, and so it's not exactly constrained. Well, you're wrong. Um, they are doing a unique job, okay? So, yes, you know, there's two of them, and you could say they're both killing the translation, but they're also both killing the rotation in a way, right? Like if, if I took this away, say I took this guy away, then this would be killing the translation, but the rotation would move to there. Okay, so by adding this guy, it's killing the rotation there, okay? But if I take this guy away, it, it kills, this guy kills the translation, but the rotation's there. So these guys both, even though it looks murky and combined, they're both really independently doing the independent unique job of killing two degrees. They're, they're two independent constraints that are killing two independent degrees of freedom, a rotation and translation. Okay? But I know it's, it's a little confusing. It's like, it looks like they're kind of doing the same job. Well, mathematically, they're not. Um, they're both doing the unique job of killing a single degree of freedom, which is why, you know, you have three constraints, and each one, you're doing three minus three, and it's truly zero degrees of freedom, okay? So this is exactly constrained. Now, if we draw our blue lines, they look like this, okay? There's our blue ideal things. Now, if something is exactly constrained, but it has no degrees of freedom, meaning you've killed all degrees of freedom, this is basically a structure, it can't move, then it's said to be totally exactly constrained, okay? And for 2D scenarios, you'll always, you know, planar 2D scenarios, to be exactly, totally exactly constrained, you're always going to have three constraints, okay? Because you, you, have, you always start with three degrees of freedom, you need your three constraints to kill them to get to zero, okay? So again, I'll repeat, if a system is exactly constrained, but it has zero degrees of freedom, then it's totally exactly constrained. And therefore, for a 2D scenario, because you have three degrees of freedom to begin with, uh, you'll always have three wire constraints if you're totally exactly constrained. Okay, so I'm just introducing definitions here. But you're probably totally exactly confused at this point. So, but that's okay. I will, I will explain this in a bit. Let, let's jump to the 3D scenario, okay? Really, t exact constraint 
is best understood by understanding its opposite. So I'll get to that in a minute. I just want to give you a sense for this, okay? So let's look at the 3D scenario. Right now, this guy's just floating in space, okay? It's got it's six degrees of freedom. We're representing them as the old engineer's way of a coordinate system in the center, orthogonal. That's fine, okay? So um, let's add a constraint here. So this is grounded. That's a, that's a wire. Which one does it kill? Look, stare at it for a little bit. Well, it, it roughly kills this translation here. And, and there's the five degrees of freedom. So six minus one is five. This guy's doing the unique job of killing a translation. Very good, it's exactly constrained. Okay, now let's add this. Okay, here's another wire going to there. Okay, um, well, you look at that and you say, which one is that one killing? Well, that one is killing this one, okay? So, you know, 6 minus 2 is 4. This goes back to that previous example. There you go. This one is exactly constrained. It's not totally exactly constrained because it has, it has degrees of freedom. To be totally exactly constrained, it has to have 0 degrees of freedom. So it's, it's got 4 degrees of freedom remaining. So, but, but it's exactly constrained because um, each of these is doing the unique job of killing a degree of freedom. Now, you might again say, but wait a minute, wait a minute. These two, they're both killing the translation. But uh, to that, I would say, yes, but they're both killing the rotation. And so, you know, in, in, according to the math, and you'll see the math, I'll teach it to you later, a, as long as you have uh, as many constraints as there are degrees of freedom that they're killing, they're doing an independent job, okay? Those two are doing, you know, an independent job of killing two degrees of freedom, okay? So it's exactly constrained, okay? All right, so add this third one, okay? Again, it, it, it kills this one. Exactly constrained. We've got three things killing three things, so it's exactly constrained. Okay. We add this one, kills this one. Again, it's exactly constrained. Okay. Now we add a fifth one. Notice, uh, you know, this indicator here. I've been ticking this away. Uh, as long as this equation is true, it's exactly constrained. Here we've added a fifth one, and I want to ask you, which one does it kill to remain? Well, again, you might say to yourself, well, it kills this one and this one. Well, you're wrong. It kills this one, and it moves that one. Okay, so so again, a wire can only kill no. It, it can kill no more than one degree of freedom. You'll never kill two or more. Okay, and so in this case, you just kill the translation. You move the rotation, and again, this obliterates the coordinate system thing. Like they're not stuck to that. Okay, so that that's how this system would move. If you did a modal analysis of this, it would rock freely about this axis. And if these were ideal constraints. It would be super locked up, infinitely stiff with all motions, except it would be able to rotate around this axis with no resistance if they were ideal constraints. Okay. Okay. So now let's add a sixth wire. Okay. And now it sh surely does kill this one. And now the system is totally exactly constrained. So all those, ex all the examples before, as I was sticking wires in, it was exactly constrained. Uh, this is still exactly constrained, except now because the degree of freedom goes to zero, it is totally exactly constrained. And the only new principle to learn here is for a three-dimensional system, a spatial mechanism kind of thing, um, to be totally exactly constrained, you're always going to have six wires to kill your six degrees of freedom. Okay. Um, so for a three-dimension thing, you need, or sorry, for a two-dimensional thing, you need three wires. For a six-dimensional thing, you need, or, oh gosh. For a three-dimensional thing, you need six wires uh, to be totally exactly constrained. Okay? All right. So again, you're probably confused, but it's okay. I mean, it's, it's all going to be clarified when we get to what the opposite of exact constraint is. Because you're probably thinking, well, how can something not be exactly constrained? Because everything we've done is exactly constrained so far in this lecture, which is true. Okay? Everything follows Maxwell's equation. Okay. Well, um, one more comment about exact constraint, and then I'm going to talk about over constraint here. Okay? So, Exact, when, when do you use exact constraint? Well, exact constraint is really critical if you want your system to be precise, I meaning you want it to be repeatable, as we've talked about. So in precision applications, like in telescopes uh, or, or in motion stages, in precision motion stages, for microscopy stages or optical mounts or things, you'll see this common, you know, this hexapod arrangement where you have six, you know, two, four, six independent the kind of wire flexures. Here there's six independent actuated wire flexures. Here's those six independent things in hexapod thing, this big uh, telescope in Hawaii here. Um, 
uh, you, you'll see total, I mean, this, and these, these are following principles, total exact constraint, but you, you'll see exact constraint in almost any precision instrument um, because it's really important, okay? And the reason you get um, high precision with exact constraint is because 